the Albany Trust was founded in 1958 uh, as the sister charity to the Homosexual Law Reform Society, which came together in response to the Wolfen Report. Um, and that was the government's attempt to address what it, it saw as the, as the social problems of both homosexuality and prostitution, interestingly, twinned together at that time in the 1950s. Um, and if you like, the, the, the Homosexual Law Reform Society was a predecessor organization to Stonewall, which Michael co-founded, um, and, and led the campaign for the partial de decriminalization of homosexuality in 1967. Have you finished then? No, it's not working upstairs. I'll have to go downstairs. Oh, right. Oops, I think we should just mute Angela. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Albany's founding trustees had a a progressive vision of a more inclusive society that would welcome different sexualities, welcome different genders, welcome different kinds of relationships. So in the 1950s, this was a really progressive group of people, uh, J.B. Priestley and Jaquetta Hawkes, two well-known people amongst them. And, and they followed what, what was called the sort of Wolfenden principle. Um, that, that he sort of set out his report with the idea uh, of condemning people who are different a little less and understanding them a little more, which is the exact reverse of what uh, uh, later on Mrs. Thatcher and John Major uh, decided that we should con condemn uh, people who are different a little more and understand them a little less. So Albany Trust was founded in a moment of progressive liberal uh, vision about a better society. So today's discussion uh, is going to be in three parts. And um, I thought I would just introduce those parts by picking up uh, the tributes that are on the front of, um, of Michael's book, which uh, I've got here with me. Uh, so the first tribute um, is from Michael's great friend, uh, Ian McCallum, Sir Ian McCallum, uh, who describes the book as a memoir to cherish. Uh, and we will talk about uh, uh, Michael's relationship with Paul, which is really the, the central uh, theme throughout the whole book. The book starts and ends, really, as a love letter to Paul. Um, and, and really the book uh, uh, explains very beautifully what it does mean to, to love and to cherish someone uh, for a lifetime. So we will come to, the, to, to, to that relationship uh, later on. Um, before that, we will pick up uh, another tribute um, from Alan Johnson, uh, who uh, is a Labour politician, probably uh, the best leader that Labour didn't have uh, mm -hmm. after Gordon Brown. Um, and he describes the book as a book to be savoured, which I puts me in mind of uh, savouring the victory of um, the, the, the battle for equality, um, LGBT equality. And that uh, is a part, an important part of the book that Michael was a central player in. Uh, a, a chapter in LGBT history uh, which took on the battle around Section 28 and, albeit kind of lost that war, uh, nevertheless lost that battle, uh, nevertheless won the war uh, that culminated in, in gay marriage today and in a, a powerful equality movement that has achieved a great deal, uh, which, which Angela, of course, was central to as well. Um, but what I want to start off with is uh, the account of Michael's childhood. Um, and if I were going to describe um, the book, I would describe it uh, as a psychotherapist, I guess, um, as, as a case study. Uh, I don't mean that Michael himself is a case study, but the book itself is a case study, a powerful case study of resilience and courage that I think shines a light for people in dark places. And what the honesty of Michael's very personal memoir gives us an insight into 
uh, is some of the difficulties of growing up gay and growing up different. Um, so I would like to um, invite Michael to uh, tell us about the, the moment, uh, which is a kind of moment of self-discovery, um, interestingly, through the experience of uh, being labelled by his own mother and his Auntie Eileen uh, uh, during his childhood. Uh, so you describe that beautifully in the book, Michael. I don't know whether you want to read that, that passage from the book on, on page 31. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and uh, I hope everyone can see me and they, they can hear me. Um, can they? I, th I can, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, and first of all, happy Pride. Um, it, I think it's brilliant that we are, that there's An Angela, you can't see her, but she's just stood up with her T-shirt on. Um, and and it's a, it's a pa today with COVID, it's a powerful reminder. Um, I went on my first Pride March, uh, I was a bit late to it, in 1979. And there were only 500 of us. And, uh, and we traipsed off uh, down Oxford Street uh, with more police protecting us. I don't know whether they were protecting us from the onlookers or the other way round. And as we marched down Oxford Street, we sh shouted, two, four, six, eight, is that copper really straight? And then the other chant that went up was, we're here, we're queer, and we're not going shopping except quite a few of us did as we went down Oxford Street. But it's a powerful reminder, suddenly not to have what we thought we would always have year after year after year. And also it's a powerful connector to those parts of the world where they have never had a pride, where the prides are being banned still in places like Russia and in places where they dare to dream that they might be able to celebrate themselves and their difference on, uh, on their streets. So, um, so happy Pride. Uh, unusually, I'm going to do, as I've been told, and read you uh, this excerpt from uh, one of them, uh, published uh, by Bloomsbury. Uh, so as, as uh, Jeremy said, I was uh, seven years old and we lived on a big housing estate in uh, East London, right here on the docks. 500 yards away from where I now live. So, life was never dull at Garford House. If there was no entertainment, then you made your own. I loved doing shows for the mums and dancing, not just Scottish country dancing like at school, but jiving and wiggling my hips and kicking my legs up like the dancers from Sunday night at the London Palladium, which was on telly. One day, when my favourite Aunt Eileen was in our flat, my mum put on a record and asked me to dance for them. I obliged and jinked and jumped and they laughed and whooped and clapped. And then I heard my mum say, I think he's one of them. I panicked. In my heart, I stopped dancing because I knew that what she had said meant I was different. And I knew I was different from the other boys. I, I just knew. I wanted to shout at her and Eileen to still tell them to stop laughing at me. But instead, I carried on dancing and hoped that they would forget what my mum had said. When I finished, they hugged me and Eileen kissed me. But I knew they knew I was different. It made me feel a bit scared and a little bit nice too. Thank, thank you very much, Michael. And I had a question before I uh, ask Angela and, and Andrew also to comment on that moment. It's a bit of a psychotherapist question, I'm afraid. Uh, but so this is the first time I've done therapy in public, but I'm very happy to go through with it. It's really what what do you think they meant what do you think your mother meant to to your aunt eileen when she said he's one of them well it was that i it's so clear now in 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 the words at the, at that time it was the tone that told me that one of them was something that wasn't 
something that you talked about in a loud voice. It was, it was whispered. Um, it was, it was kind of a, a something that had to be talked about um, with a nod and a wink. And 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 because I knew uh, at the earliest age, at round about just a bit before the, the age of seven, uh, when I underwent a, 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 an appalling attack in the East End by, by a man. Um, and I, I subsequently thought, did that, man, did that man do that to me because he knew I, I liked boys of my own age? And so that, coupled with what my mum said, um, uh, really told me that I, I, I had to be careful about myself, that I had to put the Michael that I knew and was comfortable with, I had to put him away. Um, and, um, and it's something I think a lot of people learn very early on. Um, you, and I think maybe that was why I, I danced and entertained so much, that I wanted to make people laugh and stop getting too close so that they might find out that I was this boy who was different. And of course, in the East End, um, if you were queer, as the term was, we didn't have the word gay, um, they would say, um, I think he's one of them. Um, unlike Mrs. Thatcher, who always was interested if, 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 as if they were one of us, um, but I was one of them. And it, it did, it caused that panic. Yeah. Yeah, and it underscores, of course, the, the importance of a collective sense of pride, because so often I think people will recognise, other LGBT people will recognise, starting off from that place of feeling different, being associated with some sort of vague sense of shame or secrecy or something that other people know about you that, that, that your difference represents that isn't in your control. Interestingly, Jeremy, uh, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to dominate this, but uh, it certainly didn't give me a sense of shame. Um, I mean, I carried on fancying the boys like Billy Ho. Um, and later on, you know, when I was 11, I just thought, um, girls are my friends, uh, boys are the common enemy, so I'll be with the girls. And um, so, but what it gave me was a sense, a sense of, I, I couldn't belong if I was real, I opened out the world into who that little Michael was. And so you shut that little Michael away, especially given that, that, uh, he that he was hurt, he was damaged by an adult, thankfully not in the family, um, who he should have been safe with. Mm -hmm. And sadly it was to occur, as people know from reading the book, uh, again and again and again through my team. Yeah, yeah. A Angela, um, you'll need to un unmute yourself. Um, can you... Yeah. There we go. What, what were your thoughts about when you, in, in reading Michael's account of his childhood, uh, what, what uh, came out, out of that to you? Um, I, I thought it was a very harsh childhood. And uh, Michael's lovely personality and bubbliness was sort of seeking to find a way through really quite, I thought, quite grim circumstances. Uh, um, I'm now responsible, responsible for children's safeguarding in, in my local authority, Camden. And it's absolutely horrific in a way that. Um, the abuse that you experience happens and nobody sort of I, I imagine people did notice but nobody was really called to account um so i think somebody sheila hancock describes or somebody calls your book dickensian your childhood dickensian it's, it's not that long ago is it you're not that old, no, I'm not that um, old. but some of the some of the things that happened and some of the grimness of it Seem seem to me rather rather Dickensian in a way, um, but that sense of difference I think is is common to to many lesbians and gays, uh, bisexuals, transgender, you know the whole gamut of uh, people. Um, I 
I felt different because I think my family did construct me as different. I said I had an Irish father and he often used to talk about whether I was the eldest of three girls. I think having three sisters, three of us girls was a softening experience. You had three brothers, didn't you? So, <laughs> um, and he often used to say, well, perhaps the eldest child, even though you're not a boy, you should, you can't be a priest, but you know, perhaps you should become a nun. I, I've never had any vocation whatsoever, whatsoever really. Um, so I was always treated as rather different within the family. And I think they thought that, I mean, we were a poor family, but that I would sort of carry the family fortunes. And in a way I did, you know, particularly through education, past the 11 plus and went to grammar school and then went to university. So my really difficult experiences of being gay were, were a bit later really. Um, they were in my teens and early, early 20s when you know, I began to form emotional attachments to women and I just had nobody to talk to, nobody to uh, help um, and it seemed I, I was completely doomed. <laughs> I just felt I was completely doomed and I would never have a relationship or be happy or uh, I couldn't see how I would find a way through life. And I tried therapy, Jeremy. <laughs> um, uh, and I think it's quite good. I was, I was packed off to the tabby. Um, but it was really, it was gay liberation that uh, saved me. And Jeremy, you said at the beginning, that sense of collectivity, you're not on your own. <laughs> you are, we used to talk about come, come together was the slogan in a way of gay liberation. And so that was tremendously powerful in my life. Yes, well, um, I won't ask you too much about your therapy at the TAVI back in those days because <laughs> psychoanalytic psychotherapy doesn't have a tremendously respectable history oh, really? <laughs> in relation to gay people, but we, we might touch on that later. But we spray painted the Tavistock once later in the day. Um, but we spent psych spelt psychiatry wrong. <laughs> in depressive psychiatry is a very long thing to have to spray paint it. <laughs> <laughs> let me bring uh, let me bring Andrew uh, in. Uh, I'm interested in in your perspective on this part of Michael's story, Andrew, because of course you've got uh, a very interesting childhood story yourself as well, um, which which often is associated with risks and vulnerabilities. Uh, in your case, what, what were your thoughts? Hi, Jeremy, and hi, Michael. Great to be with you. Your book is absolutely fantastic. It's, uh, it's one of the two best uh, memoirs that I've read in, uh, in the last 10 years. And the other one is Alan Johnson, who actually said very nice things about you. So you're in that very, very select club. And having, uh, as you rightly said, Jeremy, the best leader Labour never had. And uh, actually a, a really phenomenal writer like Michael, because the quality of Michael's writing is, is great too. It really leaps off the page. He's not only a great actor, he's also a great writer. He absolutely brings things alive. It was uh, a real privilege to read, and it's great to, to take part in, in, in this. Um, and what I just want to do is hear Michael speak more about it, because the, uh, it's, the, though he says that he knew what, who he was very early on, and he knew how to struggle and battle for what he believed in very early on, it's, it's a very tough thing to do. Uh, I didn't come out as, as gay till a few years ago. And I, my, my view when I was a, a kid was that there were a limit that I, you know, I couldn't struggle on every front. Though I now realise that I was gay at roughly the same age as Michael. I was also in a children's home and had all kinds of uh, challenges there. And I just thought, like, you can't take on the whole world. But Michael did take on <laughs> the whole world and we're full of admiration for it. And the, the story is just wonderful. And of course, the East End was about as tough as you could get in in terms of uh, homophobia and, and prejudice and, and sheer violence. I mean, it, when, when Angela said it was a Dickensian society, the thing that leaps out, which I saw a lot of in my childhood too, which we forget now in 2020, was that society was very violent then. People used to hit each other all the time. You know, pubs were closed and there'd be brawls all the time. Mm. You know, this is when teachers used to hit children with canes in school and things like this. It's just the violence. And when I was growing up, my great ambition was to try and stop the violence, to stop being hit, to stop being the one who the, the other boys went for in the playground and so on. I wasn't always very good at it, but nonetheless, that was my sort of uh, thing to do. So Michael's story is great and how he came through it 
and uh, not only forged so successful a career, but also became a campaigner, is a great story, and, and we all want to hear more, more about it. But if I could just add two footnotes. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the Wolfenden Report. The thing about the Wolfenden Report, which is important, is first of all, Lord Wolfenden himself, of course, came at this from personal experience, his own son was getting and the story of Wolfenden and why he came was quite a brave report, actually, for the late 1950s is itself significant. But the thing to remember about the Wolfenden report is after Wolfenden reported, nothing happened. Yeah. Literally, the then Tory government with Rab Butler, who was thought to be a modernising Tory Home Secretary, this was all too, they wouldn't go there. They wouldn't touch it at all. The person who'd sorted uh, this out and brought about the big reform actually became a very great friend of mine, Roy Jenkins, who drove through the, uh, uh, the Sexual Offences Act of 1967 with Leo Absey. Ab it was Leo Absey's private member's bill, but in fact it was Roy Jenkins who did all the spade work and uh, we made the government time of the drafting and all of that. Uh, and I knew Roy very well and we became friends until he died in, uh, in, in 2003. And he was absolutely passionate against prejudice uh, he was a wonderful man, but he didn't have particularly great sympathy for, uh, for gay people. He didn't have many gay friends. He didn't completely, I remember him telling me once over lunch, he, he didn't really understand the, 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 the gay life and what he was seeking to do was simply to get, as he used to put it to me, get the law out of the bedroom. He didn't see it as, as an act of positive empowerment. He saw it rather as simply getting the state out of personal relationships and it took a new generation of campaigners like Michael, Stonewall, Ian McKellen to move from formal legal equality, it's not even equality in the late 60s because the Sexual Offences Act doesn't give equality but it does at least remove imprisonment as a, as a, as a fine for, for being gay. It takes a whole generation to get from there to uh, the pride uh, community and values that we celebrate today. And I just love to hear from Michael Moore about how this child, this child who stands up for what he believes, then becomes one of the greatest campaigners for gay rights and pride that we've ever seen. Thank, thank you very much, Andrew. You've provided a fantastic bridge through to our next section. I, I will add just one very small footnote to the uh, story about Lord Wolfenden's report. As you say, his son, Jeremy Wolfenden, was, was gay. Uh, and uh, Lord Wolfenden wrote to his son when he took on the commission, um, Dear Jeremy, I only ask two things of you while I'm carrying out this commission. One, that we stay out of each other's way for a while. And two, that you wear rather less makeup in public. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> it goes to show how conservative these people were who were bringing about this great reform, actually. Yes. <laughs> Jeremy, before you do the, the segue, can I, can I just make a couple of points? Although um, people can't, can't, couldn't see me when a Andrew was speaking, I, I was blushing from uh, tip to toe. He's, he's extremely uh, generous. And, but, but I want to say this, he, he, he really hit on two things I, I want to reiterate. Um, the violence that, that we all lived through, the violence that, that was in our homes, the, the fact that the, the violence uh, of a man against uh, his wife in the home, in front of the children, um, it, 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 it was there. She, Sheila Hancock rightly says, I think she says, Michael describes his journey from a cruel Dickensian childhood to the dignity of the House of Lords with brutal honesty. I was shocked, amu uh, amused, et cetera, et cetera. But, but uh, uh, and the beatings that you got at school um, daily, uh, I think because I knew I was different and I knew I'd been hurt by, by people um, when I was young, uh, I, I wanted to fight because I, I wanted to prove that they couldn't hurt me. No matter how much they hurt me, I wanted to prove that they couldn't. And, and, I, and, and I had to fight with that my entire life. 
until I met Paul, who finally, after 31 years with him, convinced me that, that it was okay, I could be loved. And, and that's what, what happens when you grow up in violent societies. But all, equally, I want to pay tribute because I think it connects to the activism and, and, and the fact that we have nearly achieved uh, legal equality in the United Kingdom. We must remember not too, many, uh, too much applause because it's only recently that same-sex marriage was equalized throughout the United Kingdom. It's only recently that women in Northern Ireland were given the right to choose. So, so, but all of this started in legislative terms with that with the Leo FC, but Roy Jenkins, brilliant Home Secretary under the Wilson government, and they show if and they did things which if you'd gone on the street and asked the public, did they agree with them, they would have said no. They ended hanging. They ended corporal punishment. They gave women the right to choose. They decriminalized homosexuality and then began a whole raft of approaches towards equality for women. That's what courage in politics is all about, which is to be unpopular in the short term, to do what is absolutely right and essential for the long term. Thanks. And I mean, I can certainly myself see that, that just how tough uh, that childhood was gave you uh, this um, sense of injustice and sense of a real drive to put, uh, make the world a better place. Um, but courage in leadership does um, require other kinds of, uh, a different kind of courage, um, as well as uh, judgment um, and, and other aspects of taking risks as, as, as a leader. And, I, the question I had, um, and I'm interested as well, particularly in the work you did with Angela um, uh, around the founding of Stonewall and the early days of Stonewall, you were faced with a public opinion at that time that was not particularly supportive. And, and being in a, a sexual minority, uh, you were still very much in a, a, a minority which certainly Mrs. Thatcher felt um, she was in the poll position and, and spoke for the majority of people in disapproving of gay relationships, particularly uh, uh, children at school being taught about gay relationships then. And, and the public opinion polls did back her up to some extent because the approval around kind of homosexuality and relationships was pretty low at that time. Jer Jeremy, if you allow me, I, I, I would say this, it would be pretty amazing if the, the opinion polls didn't support her, given, given the tabloids uh, of this country that, that referred to people as pufters, yuppie puffs, um, referred to lesbians in the most appalling way. And, 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 and so, they were a part of that, the creation of the environment that gave Thatcher the political muscle that she thought she, she could be flexed. And in some instances, she was sadly also supported by some religious leaders. Um, and, and so, so it, you, we have to look at the changes that occurred within the political environment. That's why you know, when Section 28, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish on this, when Section 28 came in, the first anti-LGB law in a hundred years, um, if you had asked me that a government would bring that in in 1987, given that we had our, we weren't fully legal, but we had our pubs and our bars and our saunas uh, and our areas where we meet, if you'd said, would a government do this? I would have said, don't be mad. But what happened? AIDS and HIV hit, particularly gay men, it hit a lot of other people as well. Uh, and, 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 and as we know, it still affects people uh, uh, worldwide. But the way gay men were depicted and AIDS and HIV uh, was depicted as, I quote, the gay plague, the chief constable of Greater Manchester said that gay men were swirling around in a cesspit of their own making. Instead of being given, so, so the right wing uh, had a field day. They sensed blood, and instead of supporting us, 
and supporting gay men and, 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 and our, the community created largely by uh, straight allies and lesbians and gay men. The lesbians who, who supported the early hospices were brilliant. Um, but instead of supporting us, um, the government brought in Section 28 because it wanted to push us underground and wanted to stop local authorities who were doing positive things to support LGB, in particular LGB people, because of the, the discrimination that was on the rise and also helping uh, gay men cope with the stigmatization of, uh, of uh, HIV and AIDS. So, so it's within that, it's when you get that political, dangerous political mix, not unlike um, Brexit, not unlike what happens when you have a pandemic and, and, and you then start to, what you can't deliver, you hide, and what you can deliver, you misrepresent. So we always have to watch the political environment in which we live and heighten our uh, antennae. But, but I and I would say to, to people watching this, there are quite a few laughs in the book as well, you know. It doesn't come, it doesn't come with a razor blade and a set of pills. Um, so, uh, but yeah. Hello. Uh, let me ask then, Angela. So, Michael has has described what a what a difficult political climate it was uh, that you came into when you took on the job of chief executive at Stonewall. Um, how on earth did you manage to change public opinion? How did you manage to find a political opportunity in such a difficult climate to be able to make headway? Well, there, was, there were great attacks and one of the really strong bits of Michael's book is the way in which he reminds us how the press did treat um, lesbians and gays and the attacks, terrible attacks and vilification in the press. But on the other hand, since gay liberation, I mentioned that before, that was about 10 years earlier, slowly, slowly, people had been coming out. So by the time of Section 28, I actually think Thatcher and her allies misjudged it. It was also an attack on left-wing councils, but I think they misjudged the way, the direction that opinion was going. I think by the time Stonewall was set up, opinion, because more and more, I think Michael alluded to it, more people were coming out, uh, people were working together in all sorts of different, different uh, lesbian and gay organizations. Um, the, the terrible taboo was beginning to change. Um, so, um, I remember one of the first things I was involved with, the Law Society of all people, uh, wanted to have a non-discrimination clause and they were going to leave, leave out sexual orientation. So uh, we called a meeting of solicitors and there were all these gay, les gay and lesbian solicitors suddenly turned up at our office in Grey Coat Place. And then of course we had to deal with the, the Lord Chancellor's department and we found, and this happened continually in Stanley's life, there were actually lesbians and gays in the Lord Chancellor's department who wanted to help us deal with this situation. So I think um, it was at a very important time when um, more, as I say, more and more people were beginning to come out. And the reason that hadn't found expression is because we'd had these very long years of conservative rule. If that hadn't happened, I think um, Stonewall oh, gay rights would have, happened, would have happened earlier. But basically how we did it, I think, was by giving a voice to lesbians and gay men. And so, for instance, when we did legal cases, we did some important legal cases, the European Court of Human Rights, very important cases, armed forces, age of consent. We constructed those cases in such a way as to give voice to the applicants and to all the people who are in a similar situation to the applicants. And in political life, you can have all the slogans you want, and politicians can, uh, I mean, play a very important part. But I think what sways opinion is to other people, people seeing the humanity in people. Mm, thank you. Well, Andrew, uh, we're extremely fortunate. Uh, we have 
three very astute politicians uh, on our panel, and, and, and you are as astute as anybody, but uh, if you had been trying to fight the battle against Section 28 and Leading Stone, I mean, Michael and Angela have both mentioned the hostility, as it were, from uh, the mainstream press and from mainstream politics. What they haven't mentioned is that Stonewall was also attacked from within the gay community as a, a sort of bourgeois project that was only about kind of a, assimilation and compromise. Uh, so it, it really was a very difficult task indeed building uh, the support behind um, taking on Thatcher. What, what are your sort of reflections on, on that period? Well, it was a really, really terrible period. And what was going on was, wasn't just a, an, a homophobic prejudice, though that was very strong. It was also an attempt which uh, to, to bring um, homophobia and this hostility to, uh, to gay rights in as part of a political line against the whole of the left. I mean, it was, it was part of a, of a, of a right-wing attempt to, to, to stigmatise the left, and it went hand-in-hand hand with Derek Hatton, with Peter Tatchell, with they were all lumped in together as somehow a kind of illegitimate left. And what it sought to do, of course, was to, to negate the whole purpose of the 1967 reform. I mean, I was, I'm, uh, I was growing up in the mid 70s when the fact that gay rights were legal well you would barely know it if you were at a school in the mid 70s i mean the level of prejudice not just the kids to the kids but the teachers to the kids as well um you know the i was at a, 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 ch a church of england school where we used to get sermons every sunday it was a boarding school about the evils of um of homosexuality and uh, uh, and masturbation and all these sorts of things. I mean, this is what England was like in the mid 1970s. So what Thatcher was doing was taking all of that and making it uh, making it a critique against uh, uh, against the left at large too. But always being positive. What I think is extraordinary is how quickly things started to turn around because that's the mid 80s. And you would have thought then, it's the mid 70s to the mid 80s. You would have thought then that this was going to be nearly impossible to turn around in one generation. But within one, and one generation, we've moved from that to pride, to equal marriage, and to a society where, using Michael's language, everyone can cherish everyone, regardless of, of, of sexuality, and, um, uh, and th they can just behave and be themselves. So the other way of looking at it is that it, things couldn't really have been worse, short of, um, of uh, of still having the police on the scene, things couldn't really have been worse than they were in, in the mid eighties. But within a generation, Stonewall and and, and the whole of uh, of the gay community had turned it around, and that is a, a phenomenal story, and that should uh, give us huge optimism about what we can still do. And it's a great story of the liberty of the human spirit as well, and that's what shines through Michael's book. Uh, you are an education secretary, and I want to bring Michael back in. Uh, to think about bringing us up to date to today with with the challenges today, but um, uh, you touched there on what what uh, used to be taught in in schools and what was spoken about to do with homosexuality in schools. We we still have a, a difficult battle, um, and certainly I would imagine in the House of Lords. Uh, uh, opposition to the idea of inclusive relationship and sex education in schools, even though we have uh, legislation on the books to support it. Um, there's quite a lot of opposition to prevent it from actually happening. Um, uh, just before I bring Michael back into for his thoughts on that, what, what, what are your thoughts about how to move that agenda forward? Well, we just have to carry on championing it. It's um, it, it's not just um, inclusive education in terms of uh, relationships and and uh, and uh, and that whole part, an important part of life. It's also this Tory thing, which hasn't, in a sense, changed to try and stigmatise uh, people who are different still, uh, and to give it a political connotation. So the same people who are opposed to relationships, sex and relationships education, including, of course, 
uh, that all people are equal in schools also don't want civics or, or citizenship. When Evac talked in schools, they don't, to be absolutely blunt, they don't really want people to vote unless they're going to vote their way. So it's all part of this view that uh, uh, the people who do things differently and who have a tinge of radicalism about them need to be suppressed. Now, the Lords actually is quite progressive now. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, I think it's the Commons in some ways, which is a, more of a problem uh, than the Lords. The Lords has plenty of champions of, of, of equal rights. Um, it still does have a problem with the churches. I mean, you know, being blunt about it, the Church of England still follows, it doesn't lead. I mean, you know, we still, when we had the Equal Marriage Act, we still had these ludicrous debates in the House of Lords about churches <coughs> being prohibited buildings for the purposes of... of of, um, of gay marriages. I mean, how can that be permissible in the 2010s? And, it, you know, to a large extent, I'm afraid, the Church of England is still an organised hypocrisy. So there are still things that need to be done, and the bishops, of course, are there in the Lords. You know, I sat for a, a speech by the Archbishop of Canterbury with mounting indignation. I suspect Michael's is even greater. While the Archbishop of Canterbury explained to us why he was open and liberal-minded, but he didn't think churches should be used for gay marriages. And what we were trying to do was to give priests the right to allow their own church to be used for gay marriages on the grounds that many priests want to do so. And the Archbishop was saying he didn't want that power, I assume, just in case some actually chose to exercise it. So we've still got a lot further to go, let's be absolutely blunt about it, but, uh, but the Lords is, is, is now in a much, much better place on these issues than it was even, even 10 or 15 years ago. Thank you. M M Michael? Andrew's touched on, on that. Uh, I mean, he sounds quite optimistic to, to me, but um, the, the issue in Birmingham um, uh, was driven by uh, other religious groups and religious faith still seems to be this kind of get out kind of clause for the, for the government, uh, whereby um, LGBT rights are somehow secondary to to religious principles. Well, how, how on earth do we get past that obstacle? By not giving up. You know, I always say that, that uh, Andrew talked about what we achieved in a generation. I always say that what has been achieved has not been achieved by my generation or the generation before. It's been achieved over thousands of generations of women and men who would never give up and they stood up and they came out or they came out as allies and some of them gave their, their liberty, their livelihoods and in some instance, instances their lives. And, and because I believe that goodness and justice always prevail in the end, we have to keep pushing it. Andrew's right, the Lords is extremely progressive. Look at the, the, the vote, uh, compare the vote on same-sex marriage between the House of Commons and the Conservatives there, the majority voting against, and the House of Lords, the Conservative majority uh, voting in favour. Uh, and, um, and, and that's because in the Lords, it's, it's, it's less adversarial. It's, it's much, you listen to the arguments, no one party has a majority, so you have to win the arguments when you're bringing forward amendments. You have to build up networks of, uh, of interest, which means that you then, the, the parties often don't then vote in blocks. Um, but you, when I said you hit the nail on the head, it's really, really interesting about relationship and sex education, uh, uh, and, in, uh, and indeed, the so-called ban on conversion therapy. So the so-called ban that the government is proposing is a SOP, because it gives, it, it gives an opt for spiritual engagement, spiritual guidance, guidance. So in other words, it's saying you can, if you're a religion, or you're a religious leader, uh, you can. Uh, continue. So, so this so-called ban on conversion therapy as proposed by the government isn't a ban. And I pose the question, uh, why are you allowing uh, people to do this to others merely because of their sexual orientation, their gender identity? If it was any of the other uh, protected strands within the Equality Act, they would never dare do it. Equally, 
Michael, calm down. Equally on, um, on the issue of relationship and sex education. Why is it that only on sexual orientation and gender identity um, uh, is, is there a, uh, a kind of concern and a, a, a pullback in relation to what religions believe? Religion and belief are the most intensely personal and private things you can experience. And I say that as someone brought up as a Catholic and now a born again atheist. Because religion and belief are intensely personal and private, they should be respected, but they should never allowed to be imposed upon another. If by imposition, it reduces rights and options enjoyed by that person. And, and so we've got to tackle organized religion. I see during COVID the brilliant things that are being done on the streets uh, and, and in the homes by people who are religious and people who are not in religious organizations. But we've got to take religion out of people's lives unless they place it there. And equally, the other challenges on the whole pardons and the disregards of, of convictions that people still carry uh, for, for so-called crimes that are no longer crimes. I, I, I got an amendment through in, in uh, three, nearly four years ago in the Policing and Crime Bill. The government accepted it. The government said it would bring forward the necessary regulation so to uh, allow people to apply for pardons and disregards. Um, nearly four years later, it's still not done. I had a written question down uh, this week. That is blighting people's lives. But I do, I, I worry about what's going to happen with the Gender Recognition Act. Statements by uh, Elizabeth Truss, the, the uh, Secretary of State. I wrote to her on the 20th of May. I subsequently wrote to her again, and I still yet to receive an acknowledgement, let alone a reply. Um, and and, and I, I know this with all certainty, and it's probably the only thing I know, that if we salami slice, somebody else's rights away. Eventually somebody's going to salami slice my rights away. We advance together and we achieve together, only together. And don't take my word for it. Look at the 1930s. Look at the European Union that was born out of the ashes of the, sec the Second World War that said country won't fight country. We won't turn away. We will join together and we will not look away when a, an individual or a group is targeted and scapegoated. And that powerful image reminds us that we should not let, we should not let the rights of groups uh, be salami sliced away and, and really important, we should never allow a minority within a minority to be used publicly to represent that minority. I remember not that long ago and section 28 came out of it that all men were, all gay men were portrayed as a threat to children we weren't even allowed to work in schools sometimes not even in social care we were portrayed as peter pedophiles probably because one or two men uh, out of a hundred are making up figures but you know a tiny tiny percentage uh, might have uh, had that happen but, was it right to represent gay men and bisexual men in that way? Absolutely not. Mm. We, need to, we need to protect the rights of others, otherwise our own rights are up there on the front line to be chopped down. Yeah. Thank you. I think the point, can I just add, Jeremy, I think the point about unity is incredibly important. Um, no, gay, we wouldn't have won our rights if we didn't have allies. And uh, I actually think that there's, uh, uh, religious groups that protested uh, outside the schools in, in Birmingham and other places. I think there were real fears in the Muslim community, but they represent a minority. And I do very strongly believe that it's extremely important for us as a movement to have a dialogue with the Muslim community, to have a dialogue now, particularly with the black community, with the development of Black Lives Matter, and it's in creating that unity that we have the greatest strength and protection. Uh, Jeremy, sorry, I, I want to agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Angela has said, because the, the um, often religions are misrepresented. We, we must always remember 
um, that, pe that people are very generally in groups represented by the extremists within those groups. Um, up in Birmingham, at Anderton Park School in particular, where, where they went for the injunction, Sarah Hewitt Clarkson, the head teacher, whom I've got to know, showed amazing courage um, and, yeah. was, and was supported by, by, by religious parents and Muslim parents. But there were extremists there intent on putting their views in the way of what the school was, was doing. And I have to say, when I went to the, uh, the, court, the court hearing for the injunction become, to become permanent, yeah. I was shocked to hear three leading counsel representing uh, those opposed to the permanent injunction and one representing the Christian right refer to LGBT books as a threat. Why should they be brought into schools? Um, referring to LGBT people as somehow unsavory and shouldn't the subject shouldn't be around schools. It was not dissimilar to section 28. And so I want to re reinforce what Angela said about connectivity, working, working with others and not allowing a small, a tiny minority to misrepresent the majority of that minority. Uh, okay, um, well, I can see that uh, nobody's giving up on these battles. Uh, no. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've given politics uh, a good airing. Um, uh, I want to come now, um, as you said, the, the, the book actually um, uh, is, is all about fun uh, and the person who puts the F in fun is, is Paul. Um, so I want to take you back now, Michael, to, to Butlin's uh, Scarborough uh, and your first meeting of, of uh, a young 19-year-old redcoat, uh, uh, Paul, and uh, to tell us a bit about um, really a wonderful relationship uh, that, that was a lifetime relationship with him uh, starting out uh, uh, in Scarborough in Butlins. Yes, um, well, uh, of course, I think as people now know, I never do things easily because I was, there were 13 years between us. Paul was 19. Uh, you, you knew him well. Uh, Angela knew him very, very well. Um, and um, and I, was, I was 32. So um, I thought it's never going to work. Uh, and also, um, it's illegal and indeed we lived illegally until he was uh, 21 and uh, I was working up there I had a play of mine directed by Alan Acorn and um, and so Alan said come up join the company and then um, you can be be in on on, on us putting your play on and um, and so Barbara Windsor had it was the end of season we all got an invite to Barbara Windsor's party and it said Miss Barb, I've still got the invite. It says Miss Barbara Windsor invites you to her grand soiree at the Bucklins Grand Hotel, um, and that was how I got to meet Paul. Um, uh, there's a lovely. Uh, I nearly he was dr dragged out of my arms by a woman who shouted at me, "This is my red coat." He was a Bucklins red coat, um, and if you if you like, I could give you a little reading from when. Um, he, he came down to London um, because it sets into context that um, a very different period where gay men certainly if we showed affection in public we could be arrested for behavior likely to cause a breach of the peace um, uh, and, um, uh, and we you controlled your behavior in a, a very different way as I said our relationship was uh, illegal um, but if you want, I'll It'd be lovely. Yes, yes, okay. do please. Yeah, right. Um, and and this is this is re really you falling in love, um, uh, head over heels, and yeah. and not being able to really do anything about the fact that this person has captured your heart. So this is after the weekend in London. On Monday morning, there was a gentle silence, both of us knowing that he had to leave. I busied myself to conceal my sadness and realized that I hadn't once tried to escape him by immersing myself in work. I had just enjoyed the experience 
It felt strange and it felt new. I checked the clock and said that we should head for King's Cross to give ourselves plenty of time. The station seemed empty, yet people were all around us. I stood looking at the huge clock and mentally urged it not to move forward. Standing as close to him as I could, I tried to feel the touch of his hair on my face as he turned to look at me. He was going, going away. So much had happened in just one weekend. We had shared so much and I wanted us to share so much more. It felt like we fitted. I kept looking at him so that I could vividly recall his features when he was gone. The turn of his lips as he smiled, the flash of his teeth, the blue of his eyes with that unique hazel fleck in the left. We stood there saying nothing. I thought about jumping on the train with him, but what would happen when I got to the other end? What of my commitments in London? We had tea in the station buffet and I tried to force down a Mars bar, but I had little appetite. The clock on the wall called time on us. The train was waiting. And then it happened. Without any warning, he grabbed me and kissed me. As he pulled away, I sat there stunned. Neither of us looked around the buffet to see if anyone had witnessed it. It was as if they didn't exist. No one else did. He had kissed me in broad daylight. We smiled like idiots. Bliss fed idiots. At five minutes to two, we walked to the point of separation. An invisible line stretched between us. And again, we kissed. Then I stepped back. We looked at each other and mouthing goodbye. He turned and walked away. I wanted to call him back. I wanted to shout, I love you, Paul Cottingham. But I just stood there watching him making his way along the platform. He faded from sight and climbed into a carriage at the far end of the train. I waited as all the doors were closed. The exhaust rose above the engines of the Intercity 125 and the ticket inspector removed the departure board. And I held my vigil as the train slowly heaved itself out of the station. As if in slow motion, I turned and walked away. Thank you, that's beautiful. Before we open this up to the question and answers, uh, section and, and people's questions that have come in. Perhaps I could just invite Angela uh, and Andrew to say something. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the, the love story that is your relationship with Paul is, is obviously unique, but you, what you bring out in that reading is also the ordinariness, but, but at the same time, the extraordinariness in, in, in the period we've lived through and you've lived through of, of the visibility of those relationships and the importance then of the fight for, for gay marriage, for example. And uh, I just would like to have Angela and Andrew uh, offer some reflections on uh, love and family life uh, and, and, and visibility of, of gay relationships in society. Uh, Angela, you'll have to unmute yourself, yeah. Can you just, un yeah. Yeah, that's okay. I just want to say, first of all, that um, Paul was a lovely, lovely man. I, I always thought he was the sensible one, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, ever, if ever you were going a bit far, which did occasionally happen, happens to all of us, uh, you know, Paul was the one who kept you, kept you grounded. <laughs> I don't know if that was actually, actually true or not. <laughs> but, um, and I, um, I, I was interested, you know, that he, he found Stonewall a bit difficult because it took up all your time and attention. Also, a bit happened with my part. <laughs> just walked in, I think, <laughs> reading it. And he was a bit of a stone widow. 
that especially at the end, which is a terribly moving part, where you describe really his death, um, I was thinking that without civil partnership and marriage, how much more difficult in a way that would have been and, and how difficult it was. You know, something awful happened. If you had to go to a hospital, if somebody was very ill, um, th then, then it really, really mattered. And it was soul destroying if you couldn't, you know, well, you couldn't reveal your relationship or you weren't recognized, the hospital just wouldn't recognize you half, half the time. And I, I remember when we were campaigning for civil partnership, which I was mainly involved in, uh, we did a big survey. I mean, it's those sort of personal hurts that were really the most powerful. But actually, campaigning for family rights, campaigning for civil partnership, campaigning for parental rights, in the end was easier, I think, than campaigning for sexual rights, in a way. Because everybody does have a family. <laughs> uh, well, most people have families and somebody they love. And so people could, I think, really understand and empathize uh, with what we were trying to argue for. And I was amazed, I and mean, I think the campaign in a way began um, when, when the GLA introduced, but Ken had to introduce civil partnerships, and it was thought that this would be, you know, seen as mad or not very unpopular. And in fact, it was fantastically popular. And the press, people like Gary Littlejohn, who'd been terrible to us, suddenly flipped over and started saying, "Yes, this is this is this is right. This is something that that should happen." So, um, and they and they were. They're, they're kind of bedrock rights, um, and without them, it's quite impossible to think of people enjoying citizenship in, in our society. Um, so it was fantastic that they were greeted with really a lot of enthusiasm, I think, because people could understand and relate to it. But those uh -huh. parts of the book are very brave. But, and your struggles uh, in your relationship, I think that's brave as well to write about that. But, but I think just before a Andrew comes in, a Angela, you're, you're, you're right that um, uh, about our partners, yeah, that are often um, they, they make enormous sacrifices so that we can do what, certainly in, in speaking for myself, what I become obsessed with. You know, I, I don't get half engaged. Um, <laughs> and, and and Paul was the the, the, se the sensible one, um, and uh, and my life in that hospital um, with consultants and others, um, without the civil partnerships and the rights that that came with it, would have been horrific. And interestingly, mm -hmm. when you when you enter grief. Um, in a strange way, you have to come out again uh, because people mm. presume when you say, um, I mean, I now say my husband died, so I don't get into somebody saying, oh, what did she, you know, if you say your partner, it's immediately there's a presumption. Mm. Um, and so you, you're right in that people do understand those common areas that we share about how we wish to live our lives. And as Andrew said earlier, about Roy Jenkins wanting to take the law out of the bedroom. Interestingly, that was what Edwina Curry said when she put down the amendment with Neil Kinnock in 94 for the Equal Age Consent. She said, I don't believe that the state should involve itself in matters of the bedroom. And, and interestingly, coming out and defining ourselves as individuals um, gives a very different image to, the, to the, the image that the media used to like giving to lesbians, gay men, bisexual, trans, etc. I've said thank enough. Thank you. And Andrew, you, you, as you mentioned earlier, have taken the very brave uh, step of, of coming out. And although um, in Parliament now, you are amongst uh, friends, I think, uh, and other people who are openly LGBT, I don't think we have a transgender MP as yet, but it's still a relatively new thing. Um, 
and quite a step to take. What, what, are, what are your own reflections on that for yourself as, as well as uh, Michael's uh, relationship? Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself again, Andrew. Can I, can I relate it directly back to Michael? Because the crucial thing, if you're taking these big decisions at any age in, in any context is, is, is role models, seeing people who've done it before you, which gives you a lot of courage to do things that otherwise would be much harder. And of course, um, there are large numbers of really wonderful role models in Parliament. I mean, a very good friend of mine is Ben Bradshaw, who I think was the first person to get elected for the first time openly gay. I mean, Chris Smith had been before, who had, um, uh, who had already been elected and, and one or two others. But having, having these role models is hugely important. But I want to bring Michael back in as soon as possible because we want to hear from him because there was, we've been going for an hour and a quarter so far and no one has mentioned the word EastEnders. And of course, there's no, no, nothing that does is more important to creating role models and enabling people to be themselves than them seeing it in soap opera. And that perhaps, I don't know, I'd be really interested to know whether Michael thinks that's his biggest contribution that he's made to, uh, to, e to uh, e equal rights is the role model that he was himself as a, as a TV star. I mean, that, as it seems to me, that probably is his biggest contribution. It may even be that's a bigger contribution than Stonewall. <laughs> it's so important that people can look at look at TV, they can look at soaps, they can look at uh, you know now box sets and all of that, and they see people like them with struggles like theirs, lives like theirs. And he led the way in EastEnders, and we can't let this 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 wonderful discussion end without him giving us his reflections on what was it looks to me his boldest and bravest move, which was the EastEnder kiss. <laughs> thank, thank you, Andrew. Now, Andrew, Michael, Andrew obviously hasn't seen this kiss because this is just about the tamest kiss you could imagine. Oh, but, there, but, but there were there were two kisses. You see, the first kiss was, <clears throat> was between Colin and Barry in 1988, and um, my voice is going. I'll, I'll sound like June Brown in a moment. And um, uh, and the second kiss, and that was a peck on the forehead. And the tabloids went berserk. There were calls for the show to be taken off air if they didn't take the uh, the characters. Then in 1989, we did a full lips on kiss uh, with his new partner Guido. Um, and uh, although there was condemnation from the tabloids. Uh, uh, the uh, the politicians had calmed down, but but I'm really proud of what we did in EastEnders because the tabloid reaction, the political reaction, um, was crazy. I, I detail it in 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 my book. I, I detail what we what we had to um, personally put up with uh, some of the political pressure on the BBC. But I have to pay absolute credit to. Um, uh, Julia Smith, Tony Holland, uh, Julia was the original producer and, and with Tony uh, they, they, they co-created the show <laughs> and, um, and, I, I, and they always stuck to their guns. When I, in the middle of that show, Section 28 came in and all I knew was I had to be on that march. I had to be on that march and, and I tell the interesting story of, of how it happened. Because I knew, Andrew alluded to these kind of situations earlier. You, you know when a moment comes in front of you that if you don't react in the way you instinctively know you should, you will never be able to look at yourself in the mirror again. Um, and so that collision of, uh, uh, of, of Section 28 and me in EastEnders uh, and I'm uh, um, being openly gay uh, meant that I couldn't walk away. That I had to get involved in that campaign, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm immensely proud of what we did. And 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 they were so clever. You know, I was in the show for three months, and nobody knew he was gay. Um, there were, you know, the women were taking an interest in him, and uh, Pat Butcher even made a play for him. Ooh. He did. Uh, he ducked very quickly. Um, and um, so they got to know the man and they got to see that the man was an ordinary man who was in love with an ordinary boy who worked in the market. 
and who was accepted in his community. That was brave, considering that AIDS and HIV, as I said earlier, uh, was being targeted as the gay plague and used mm. to deny people um, their place in society. Thank, thank you. Um, I have to agree with Andrew that, that those sorts of representations uh, are probably even more important in a way than the official curriculum in schools around relationship and sex education. If, if only your good friend Ian had, had managed to persuade them to allow Gandalf to, to kiss uh, Aragorn at some stage during Lord of the Rings, we, we would have made so, so much more headway. <laughs> that would have been Ian's greatest contribution, uh, in addition to they, they shall not pass. Uh, and of course, we're talking of they shall not pass, we must remember that Ian came out in the middle of a radio interview uh, against uh, uh, the editor, I think he was the editor of the Sunday Telegraph, per Peregrine Worsthorn, when Ian said, but if you're talking about them, you're talking about me. Uh, I'm, I'm gay. Um, and Ian hadn't come out until then. Uh, and, and coming out and role models, uh, knowing that your teacher's gay, knowing that your next door neighbor, that it's a same sex uh, couple. That's the power of ordinariness that means politicians and extremists Will think twice before they attack us because of our ordinariness which is as extraordinary as anybody else's mm -hmm. well we must we must try and have some time for some of the questions from people who've been listening to the discussion so marie um, um fire away sure um this is a question uh, from david hawkins um Michael is an amazing and inspirational example of someone who's experienced a devastating loss, but now lives a wonderful and rich life. I've just lost my husband after 19 years together and life seems very bleak and there must be many in a similar situation. Does he have any advice on how to heal and live again? Thank, thank, thank you for, for that. And I, and I said at the start that I thought your, your book was a powerful case study uh, and a light for people in dark places and I partly meant uh, uh, dealing with grief um, and, and the way that you've had to deal with grief and how you describe that in the book so so yes Michael do hey, David can I can I say um, my my heart is with you um, it's the you, people use the term loss um, I, I haven't I haven't lost Paul uh, I've I've lost his physical presence um, six years ago, you remember this, that, that once loved, we are forever changed. That there is a wonderful book that puts it so beautifully called Levels of Life by Julian Barnes. Um, so that, that, that you, you are different at, because of him. And so long as you breathe, so he too will breathe. So long as you laugh, he will laugh and do remember this because I say it to myself and when we cry they cry too. Um, therapy helped me being able to talk to a stranger without any fear uh, of what I said that I could get up and walk out of that room um, and, and see him in the most unusual places in, in, in that cloud that suddenly gets across the sky and creates a sunset that wasn't there before and remembering that as that sun is setting, that elsewhere, the most amazing dawn. That's how I see Paul, um, because sadly, I don't believe in religion, um, but I do believe that energy can be neither created nor, nor destroyed, and that his energy is around. Um, and the, the 19 years that you had have changed you forever. Um, and it's only love that sustains. Grief is a bit like wearing at times a metal jacket. And at other times it becomes a bit like a worn cardigan. You notice it's there. And sometimes actually you can pull it around you to remind yourself that it's okay to grieve because you love. Not past tense, because you love. Thank, thank you, Michael. And of course there, there's going to be so many families who are grieving in, in our current situation uh, at the moment. Um, and 
the way that you write and, and I follow your Twitter and you post your thoughts about Paul uh, and reminders of Paul, I think every day really, uh, uh, still in your life in that sense, uh, is, is really very moving. So, so yes, thank you very much for that. Marie, what other questions have we got? Uh, well, while, while we wait for some other questions to come in, there's, um, I was just wondering about your vision for the future. You mentioned about connectivity and building relationships. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that while we wait for some other questions to come in. Um, I, I think, if, I'm, if I may, Jeremy, through you, uh, I think now more, more than ever, um, post-COVID, we, we've got to look at things differently. Uh, there's got to be a reordering uh, of uh, how we prioritize people. Isn't it interesting? I mean, uh, my, my bins uh, are still cleared in the middle of this. The streets are still clean. Um, the uh, shops are still have their cashiers. These people keep our lives running. We've never noticed before. And I think that that is part of the connectivity. I think the part of, of saying that Islamophobia happens and matters as much to me as a white gay atheist as it does uh, to a committed Muslim. To, to stand in the shoes, we must always stand in the shoes of the least equal and the most defamed and, uh, and imagine, what if that were me? What if that were someone I loved? Would it be okay? And if, if the answer is no, then it shouldn't be okay for somebody else. And rights are going to come under attack because there's never a, a, a full frontal attack on rights. It's always a reason. We, have, we cannot have that anymore because the economy means we need to free up employers. We need to free up employment space. They, they, people should be allowed to discriminate. They, and, and so it begins. Um, and I fear about the way Trans women in particular uh, are misrepresented. The things that people are, are saying that they will do in shared spaces, uh, uh, th these things that these people put up as fears and obstacles for, uh, for reform of the gender recognition, like, these things are actually crimes already. So we need to get back the debate back to where it should be, which is about acceptable behavior in shared space, whether it's private space or public space. It's that. So whether I'm in a room with a whole bunch of other men, I'm not interested in whether, whether their gender identity or their sexual orientation, heterosexuality or what. It's the behavior that is acceptable in shared space. Let's get back to that and not defame uh, people. Um, and, and so, and I, I do think, uh, you know, that the, there is the, the, this growing anti, this the whole range, I, I think Brexit released it. I think there's a dark underbelly and certain people gave a voice to extreme positions and people who perhaps for one reason or another felt disconnected, suddenly felt validated and what they whispered before, they now shout. Um, and the fact that we have it being shouted in the White House uh, is even more worrying. Mm. Thank you. So we only have two or three minutes uh, left before we, we should finish. I, I, sorry to interrupt, there's another question that's come through. Yeah. Um, if we may just, um, this is from Fiona uh, McTaggart. Um, she says uh, she thinks that one of the cleverest things uh, regarding EastEnders was Michael's character um, getting MS, not AIDS. It really helped to challenge a stereotype. Fiona, it's wonderful that you're online. Um, you, you do have done and you continue to do amazing things. Thank you. Um, that was clever because Colleen didn't know what was happening to him. Um, and, um, uh, and so viewers for about four months thought he's got, um, he's HIV positive. He's got AIDS. He's got AIDS. Uh, and so when Dr. Legg finally tells him that it's, uh, it's MS, not only did it enable us to do a, a, a lot of information about and bring a, MS uh, to a greater level of awareness, but, but we challenged the, the stereotype that people have been developing in their own 
minds and that it brought them up sharp. And then, of course, EastEnders did it brilliantly when who in the show is HIV positive? But that young heterosexual Mark Fowler, again, uh, brilliantly showing that, um, uh, uh, that everyone uh, was at, uh, at risk if they took their own personal risks uh, from uh, contracting the, uh, the HIV virus. Very clever. They, they, did, they, they did it well then. I'm not saying they don't do it well now, but, uh, and I have to say also, I didn't really say earlier to the Omnibus, a uh, huge thank you for this. Uh, I'm uh, a patron of uh, Omnibus. It's a brilliant space. It's an innovative space uh, and I can't wait to get back there. So thank you. Well, we should wrap up and I should uh, also start by reiterating uh, uh, my thanks as well to Marie and everybody and Ellie uh, at Omnibus uh, for hosting this. But of course, uh, I also really want to thank uh, Angela uh, for joining us and Andrew for joining us. And, and most of all, yourself, Michael, for a wonderful memoir, which uh, I shall certainly reread. Uh, uh, I struggled to get through to the end of it because it was uh, quite heartbreaking at the end, but I, I, I enjoyed it uh, tremendously and I shall certainly be reading. Thank you. Well, I'm glad it was heartbreaking because that proved you've got a heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Uh, bye.